Shabbat Shalom, Moedim Simcha. It's a wonderful time to be together. Uh, this is the uh, the odd couple time of the year. Uh, how many people here remember either the play Odd Couple or the longer lived uh, TV show Odd Couple? Of course, of course, we could probably still hum the theme song. Da -da 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 -da, right? Very, very catchy tune. Uh, you know, you probably still remember the basic premise, which is what happens if you take two people that are totally different in personality, throw them together into an apartment. Well, comedy will ensue, obviously. Because, you know, that's the way sitcoms work. But we have no better example of the uh, comedy of opposites than we do of the holidays over the last few days. Right, we are now celebrating the holiday of Sukkot. I hope everybody knows that. Yes, if not, now you do. And Sukkot is perhaps the most physical holiday we have. Uh, yes. We get the matzah, and that's a very important part, and our seder, and all of that, or for Passover, and the cleaning should not be uh, scoffed at. But when it comes to sight, and sound, and smell, and feel, and all of the tastes that come through Sukkot, through the fruits, through the sitting in the sukkah, the shaking of the lulav, the aromas of the different uh, species that you hold, the sound of the lulav the sounding like grapes, it is a very, very multimedia experience, to use the, uh, the cliché term of the modern world. It is something that hits every part of our senses. But it only comes five days after which holiday? Yom Kippur, which is the exact opposite. Right? On Yom Kippur, there's no taste. <laughs> right? uh, but by definition, we are fasting on Yom Kippur. And there are no special sights. Uh, we are supposed to be as blank as possible. That's why we wear a white kittle. It's not about a fashion parade. It is about being as uniform and free from focusing on who's wearing what and who's looking good and who's looking at whom. We are supposed to be stripped of all of that. We don't anoint ourselves. We don't wear our fancy, comfortable shoes. It is meant to be as detached from this physical realm as possible. Only five days apart. It's kind of a heavy turn to be going through, to be riding the high of Yom Kippur and then suddenly be plunged right back into the nice but grubby materialism of Sukkot. But when we think about it, first of all, the two holidays are not as different as you might think. Because yes, Sukkot is much more hands-on, tactile, and material, and physical, and all of those other good olds, uh, as opposed to the spirituality of Yom Kippur. But think of the way that we represent that on Sukkot. Do we celebrate our physical amazingness by building the nicest house we can? No. By definition, the Sukkah has to be, well, a hut. A shack. It, it can't be too nice. That, that doesn't mean we can't make it as comfortable as possible. But there is a limit to how comfortable we can make it. It is not about embracing our physical comfort desires quite as much as you might think. Additionally, when we are celebrating the holiday of Sukkot, we read from a very special book, from the book of Kohelet, uh, as it is called in English. Uh, I guess it's English, but it's not from English originally, the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, which I highly recommend, and then call me because it's a little confusing in places, and it might even be a little depressing in places, you'll realize that the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that the material world is pointless, that it's all in vain. Vanity of vanities, you may know. There's nothing new under the sun. You can run around and eat everything you want, do everything you want, and really does it make a difference. The book of Ecclesiastes is quite a um, sober pill to swallow when we are in the petty enjoyment of Sukkot. It is much more of a Yom Kippur kind of theme than you would have thought during the holiday that is nicknamed Hechai, the festival. But despite the similarities, they are indeed very different holidays. And very intentionally, and I believe very uh, astutely, put together so close to each other. Because they represent the fact that we are both. We are both Yom Kippur, and we are both Sukkot.
quote, creature. That is not something that is one or the other. We are meant to represent each of them. After all, on Sukkot, we are meant to embrace the beautiful and good things that God has given us to us, the ones that are permitted, which is a long list. And we are meant to fill ourselves with the goodness of God's world, to enjoy its natural beauty, and to be grateful for, for all that we are able to see and taste and touch and smell and hear and all of the other senses that are um, tickled during this holiday. Judaism does not say that a person should become like a monk living far away from the material world and only in the rarefied realms of the, of the spirit as though we were living Kosh 24-7, or Yom Kippur 24-7. Judaism says we shouldn't become an ascetic that is uh, doing all of the uh, pleasures of this world. In fact, it is forbidden to live a lifestyle like that where a person refuses to enjoy the blessings that God has made available. Judaism says, eat, drink, love, laugh, live. You need this. And after Sukkot, I think that's a very important message. It might be tempting for many people to come after Yom Kippur. It's a very important message. It might be tempting to come after Yom Kippur and say, that was the most amazing experience. I want to live like Yom Kippur all the time. And Sukkot comes five days later and slaps you in the face and says, no, you don't. Because that's not your job. It's your job to do that once a year, absolutely. It is your job to, to dip your toe into the spiritual waters of the heavens above and then to come back refreshed and cleansed and prepared for this world because this world is where your job is. We are not only meant to be elevated from this world, we are meant to elevate this world, having enriched ourselves spiritually. God did not just give us this world as the uh, ante room, the, the, the foyer to the world to come. God gave us this world and access to the spirituality of the world to come in order that we could improve this world through it. Every time we say a blessing where we are thanking God for the gift of a mitzvah, you probably all know the formula very, very well. The standard first six words are, should be uh, ingrained upon you. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, Adonai, Lord, uh, ruler of, our, of the universe. Asher kidishanu b'mitzvotah, who has made us holy through his commandments. Kitivanu and commanded us on the Hilatulah to take up the Lulah or any of the other commandments that we are doing. But you'll notice something about these commandments. We are doing them. By doing the commandments, we are taking a piece of this world and we are saying, this is holy. This is sacred, and by me performing a commandment with it, I am not only proclaiming that my life has an added dimension of, of, of sanctity to it, but I am proclaiming that this world is the vehicle for sanctity, and I am the, the, the tool that allows this world to become reflected, uh, a reflection of God's holiness. When we perform the commandments, it is a two-way street. It is not merely performing some ritual. It's not merely doing some action. It is not merely some spiritual activity. It's not just mindfulness. It is all of that blended together. The world and the soul become one. And that enrichment of this time of year, of Yom Kippur and Sukkot, that's not the odd couple. That is a beautiful pairing. It's one of the ways that Judaism has ensured that we maintain a proper balance and a proper perspective and understanding of ourselves, our world, and what God has called us to do. Asher Kiddishanu, God has made us holy by what we do. And what we do, it can be fun, it can be nice, but it can always be simple. Shabbat Shalom, Moladim Lesimchat.